is Stacey Abrams has really changed the game here. Stacey Abrams is this failed gubernatorial candidate. She lost, then she wouldn't concede, then she keeps pretending that she didn't lose, and now she's campaigning actively, openly for vice president. Really, it's really ugly. It's an ugly thing to do. Doesn't look good. I mean, but the the media are are really enthusiastic about her for a number of reasons. And so now the other people have to campaign as well, including people like Gretchen Whitmer. So I wouldn't be surprised at all if the Biden campaign has never picked up the phone to talk to her. She wants to take this shot across the bat to say, hey, wait a second. This isn't just Stacey Abrams running for vice president. I am running for vice president too. And she's not getting anywhere near the coverage that Stacey Abrams is. I've wanted to get to this article all week. This is an article from the Washington Post. I think it's like 60 pages long. It's a profile of Stacey Abrams that is, I'm not joking. I think it's like, it's a, it's novel length profile <laughs> in the Washington Post of this failed governor candidate. And but what uh, Stacey Abrams, all she's ever been is a state rep. And yet she's being talked of as one of the most important politicians in America. Just a few lines to give you the sense of this fiction. Just a few lines to give you a sense of this propaganda. The power of Stacey Abrams. Despite losing the Georgia governor's race in 2018, she has moved quickly to political prominence. Right, because you you gave her political prominence. She, ha- she hasn't moved quickly to it. You've just given it to her because you wanted to pretend that she won the race anyway. Will she be the vice presidential pick for Democrats? I, I don't know. You you guys are doing this. So or is she, I should ask you, <laughs> Washington Post. You're the ones who are going to pick this kind of thing. First line, there is a big buzz at the Loudermilk Convention Center in downtown Atlanta at a gathering called Paradigm Shift 2.0. When she, Stacey Abrams, is finally introduced, the women shout and leap to their feet. Young women stand on chairs, camera phones flash. Abrams, who appears both amused and slightly disturbed by the fuss over her. Yeah, I bet she's real disturbed. Stacey Abrams hates the limelight. (laughs) Yeah, there's one thing I know about Stacey Abrams. She hates getting attention, right? This woman who refuses to admit that she lost the race, goes on television all the time, pretends to be the governor of Georgia. Yeah, no, she's disturbed by the fuss over her. She takes control of the chaotic scene. She takes control. She's a leader. I've witnessed this level of affection for very few political leaders in the democratic circles I've been in since the 1980s. Yeah, no, you've witnessed this level of affection for whichever one you guys are elevating at any given moment. Sure, I guess you can only really elevate one at a time, but you got, you pick it. You are the circles. You are the affection. And then this is, this is the best line. Pandemonium ensues as she walks to the far left of the stage like a runway supermodel. I'm not going to make any comment about that. I'm, I'm just reading the Washington Post. Don't, you can't trick me into making a comment about that. I'm just, see, the words say, it's right there. She walks across the stage like a runway supermodel, stops on a dime, poses, tilts her head slightly, and smiles. Camera flashes, explode. She pivots, she next pivots and walks slowly to the center of the stage, freezes there and repeats the pose. Again, the flashes explode. They explode. They don't explode. <laughs> that is, cameras haven't worked that way in a hundred years. The image that she's giving you is like at some old timey press conference and the guy's holding up the flash and he's got the camera and they click it and the light bulb and the camera explodes. That, none of that happened. None, none of what is being described here happened except in the imagination, the fevered imagination of the partisan operatives who pretend to be journalists at places like the Washington Post. That's living in fiction. That's living in fantasy. That's living in delusion. And it's something that Democrats do regularly. The trouble with that, it ties right back in to what we were talking about with the coronavirus, with the Faucian bargain. The trouble with that, with staking all of your credibility on this fantasy, rather than just like calling it like you see it, having a little bit of skepticism, looking at the facts and interpreting them as accurately as you can. Trouble with just pushing this fantasy as if by merely saying certain things, you can change reality. This has been the left's pitch 
going all the way back to intellectuals like Karl Marx, right? If you just change the words, you will change the reality. If I call a boy a girl, then, it, then the boy really is a girl. If I say that the disease is, the virus is going to kill everybody, it's going to kill 3 million people, then it really will. If I say that the virus spreads in a certain, then it really will. If I say that this failed gubernatorial candidate is a runway supermodel, the most important politician in the last 20 years in American history, then that really will be the case, but it won't be. But it won't be because reality reasserts itself in the end. And that is our wonderful conservative consolation when we consider all those shady deals, Fauci and bargains that the left makes.